So, are you a no drama person? Come on, look at me. We're turning up the heat. Super, super hot. And having a blast. There's something like sexy. Whoa. It's the hottest show on YouTube. You have excellent taste. Ladies and gentlemen. With the conversations you want to listen to. Do you feel like you've been deep in love before? <laughs> you won't find a lineup like this anywhere else. You're being controversial out of the gate. <laughs> I love it. You never know who you're going to see. That was like, whoa. Or what they will say. You have to roll the dice. Oh, baby. Hey family, Carlos Watson here. I think we got a good show for you today. We have Tony Hale. Now you've loved Tony on Beep, on Arrested Development, and a whole lot more. Now he's back with something really special. He plays not one, but two characters in the highly anticipated adaptation of the best-selling book series, The Mysterious Benedict Society. You gotta watch it. For more, here's my time with Tony Hale, my fellow Floridian. Do you have a certain kind of actor who you work well with? Having worked on Beep, working with Julia Louis-Dreyfus was kind of a dream. Your hair makes me so gassy. You could talk about that. That's the thing that stuck in my head. Not getting the job, not where I was going to stay. I was like, I got to get underwear, guys. I'm studying cartography now, the mapping of uncharted territories. Sure. I enjoy comedy because it, it comes from pain. I'm mom and I want to shoot down everything you say so I feel good about myself. I do very anxious characters because I've struggled with anxiety for most of my life. The show that's coming out, that shot in Vancouver for five and a half months. How's the last year been for you guys? I'm on a lot of drugs now. <laughs> Just kidding. There's a trend that's going to be gone, but I'm going to be like, no. I got 500 made, and you're going to take it. Can I show you a picture? Show me. Oh, nice. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey, Tony. Hey. Hey, Carlos. How are you? Good. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. I want to, like, get it to where I just see you and not my mug. Okay, there we go. I'm so tired of looking at myself on Zoom. Are you Zoomed out? They've said that this generation, there's, they might use the word Zoom in it, like Generation Zoomers or something like that, because that's all they've known this year, which is sad. Where are you right now? I'm in LA. So we've been here about 18 years, because right after I got married in New York, we moved out here, because uh, that's when I booked Arrested Development. And finally, there's Buster, the youngest of Michael's siblings. Hey, hey, Buster. <laughs> was that tough to book Arrested Development? Did that come easily? Well, I moved to New York in 1995, but I was just like, I'm going to try this acting thing. <laughs> just, I look back on that. I'm, I don't know if you look back in your 20s, and I'm just like, what the hell was I thinking? I, <laughs> I mean, I just must have been on something. My first show was like Shakespeare in the Parking Lot, and I just like <laughs> did brand new stuff. <laughs> and I started doing commercials, and I did commercials for a really long time. But don't forget, your non-winning ticket could be worth $1 million dollars but i could not find an agent to represent me for tv and film because no one could see me past commercials so finally i found a manager who started sending me out and then a year later the audition for arrested development um, came by and i remember reading it and just thinking oh this is this is too funny like this is too good to be true then i got a call back and they flew me out to la and i was like oh man this is pretty intense. I remember booking the gig out here and then them just shooting the pilot right away. You know, you don't need to do that, buddy. It's okay. Thanks to the family's largesse, Buster has studied everything from Native American tribal ceremonies to cartography, the mapping of uncharted territories. Actually, I'm studying cartography now, the mapping of uncharted territories. Sure. Yeah. I vividly remember thinking, I don't have enough underwear. I need to go to Old Navy to get underwear, so walking across, it's like, that's the, that's the thing that stuck in my head. Not getting the job, not where I was gonna stay. I was like, I gotta get underwear, guys. I gotta, <laughs> <laughs> I've gotta be clean for you. I gotta be clean. And then we shot the pilot, came back to New York, and we, we got married, well, sorry, 10 days before we got married, the show got picked up. And I was like, sweetheart, I think we <laughs> might be moving out to LA. And my wife, bless her heart, she was a makeup artist on SNL for like seven years. And she thankfully made the choice to come with me. And so we've been here ever since. How'd you guys meet? We met actually at church in New York. Did you know early or did it take you both a little while? I was the just typical moron that was terrified of commitment. And we started doing the whole like group dates. And then finally, I think she said like, hey, either we're gonna, 
Like, are we gonna go out on a one-on-one -on -one date? And I think our first date was um, Zoolander. Derek Zoolander. He's almost too good looking. I remember vividly because it was during 9-11. That was that month that we started to kind of date. Did 9-11 have any impact on uh, the trajectory of the relationship? I mean, I'm sure it did. I think for all of us there, it was the craziest thing because there was no other place you'd rather be than in New York when that went down. And the whole city just gathered together. I'll never forget like the just smelling the ash all throughout the city. And so I definitely think obviously it had a big part of kind of me, you know, prioritizing my life and, and what matters. And I think this business can, you can get very, um, your priorities can be out of whack. So it definitely, I'm sure, had a, a big wake up call to that, yeah. What's your favorite role that you've ever had? Gary on Veep. Okay, guess what? I've managed to get a fresh batch of those European sweeteners you like so oh, much. Oh, thanks, Gary. Yeah, they're great sweeteners. <laughs> right, right? Yeah. They are awful. And then Chicken Archibald. I did this children's show. Archibald's next big thing. <laughs> I think you've confused me with another skinny chicken. <laughs> I think you've confused me with another skinny chicken. Talked about being present, and I loved playing this and writing for this chicken. Do you have a certain kind of actor who you work well with? Having worked on Veep for so long, working with Julia Louis Dreyfus was kind of a dream because we would get into this kind of comic dance. Beer makes me so gassy. You could talk about that, about how it always bloats you, beer. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Because my character was never allowed to really speak. <laughs> she would never let me speak. I was even called the bitchy mime on the show. I would like, if I was putting on her jewelry, like, I don't know, it was just this fun kind of dance we would do. And that kind of, when you're riding that comic wave with somebody, it's so much joy and so life-giving. Were you acting in, in high school? My brother was very into sports. I was not. Sports is pretty much religion down in the South. My parents were like, I don't know what to do with this kid. And so my neighbor was in this acting program called Young Actors Theater. My parents said, well, we'll sign him up for that. And I think I just began to thrive in that environment. I'm a huge advocate for arts education just because even if you don't make it a career like I've made it a career, certain personalities need that environment to find themselves and thrive. And I was definitely one of those kids. I saw you in one of these conversations say that you were bullied as a kid. What was it like for you? I was an artistic kid growing up in the South. And so I think just out of um, not knowing what to to do with this kind of personality. There was a lot of names called, a lot of like pushing it around. And I don't know if it's because I just kind of detached. I don't, I know it happened and I know that, but I don't have much of a, when it happened, I, I think I just kind of, and I would use humor to just kind of check out. Like if I was called the um, names and in high school or middle school, I would just kind of to myself, like make a joke, like, huh, that was a, <laughs> That wasn't very nice, or, you know, or like, or just almost like a self-soothing thing. Like, well, I think you're better than that. <laughs> like, or, I enjoy comedy because it, it comes from pain. I'm mom and I want to shoot down everything you say so I feel good about myself. <laughs> you know, and also I do very anxious characters because I've struggled with anxiety for most of my life. Oh, oh you're hungry. I know how to do that well. By the grace of God, I think it can be used for beautiful things and fun things and art. But it wasn't an easy road, you know, getting to that place. How do you think you were able to detach? Um, I, I'm on a lot of drugs now. <laughs> um, I, uh, <laughs> I did something called cognitive behavioral therapy, where I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's, um, I felt for a long time I was very much the victim to my emotions and my thoughts. And, and cognitive behavioral therapy makes you more of an observer of your thoughts and your feelings. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. How's the last year been for you guys? The show that I, that's coming out, um, The Mysterious Benedict Society, that shot in Vancouver for five and a half months. Hello? I'm the aforementioned Mr. Benedict. You all possess a quality that is lacking in our society. Rainy, your intuitive understanding of human nature. Sticky, your reservoir of knowledge. Constance, your defiance of conventional thought patterns. Kate, your uncanny feel for how things go together. 
What is it that you all have in common? I see fear and bad fashion. You're very unpleasant. Okay. When I booked the job back in spring, I was thinking, oh, this is great. It's Vancouver. It's an hour and a half flight. My daughter's in high school, so I can fly back and forth. And that's great. Cut to pandemic. I booked the job, and then I'm in Vancouver for five and a half months, and I can't come back. And so it was really tricky. The comfort that we were all given is that everybody's in the same situation. You know, it's not like I am the only parent missing out on some high school performance. My daughter was home doing school remote. Everybody was in the same place. And let me tell you right now, I have poo-poo technology for so many years to like, oh, this is separating us. It's like everybody's on their devices. Thank God for FaceTime. We've just changed our entire experience. I was able to connect with my wife and my daughter twice a day face to face. I was able to help my daughter with her homework. And I was like my face at the dinner table on a computer while everybody's having dinner. And also just be super grateful to have had a job during what, what was an incredibly difficult season for so many people. You need a bunch of smart orphans to do a deadly mission. I get it. Ideally not deadly. The show takes place in a time where it's something called the emergency is going on. And the emergency is causing just widespread panic and fear, but no one can kind of put their finger on where it's coming from. And I play Mr. Benedict, who is this kind of affable kind of genius. And he recruits these four kids to help him find the source of this. And this is what I love. These kids do not have magical powers. They don't have crazy superpowers. Their superpower is their intellect, their creativity, and their empathy. Through that, they go and help find the source of this. And it turns out my twin brother, who I also play, is the source of this kind of subconscious manipulation that's happening. And it's really, it's a beautiful story, beautifully shot. I'm, I'm very excited about people seeing it. And how did you feel about playing twins? Or have you done that before or no? I haven't done that before. And it was pretty intimidating. The crazy thing, Carl, is, is I started the job and uh, the whole crew was masked. I mean, if I had seen these people without the mask in the grocery store after working with them five months, I wouldn't know who they were. They're like, hey, Tony, I have no idea who you are. Everybody was masked. It was crazy. That's going to happen somewhere where you are going to like meet eyes with someone and you're going to be oh, yeah. like, I know you from somewhere. You'd be like, we yeah. worked together for five months, dude. I was like I right there with you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And let me tell you right now, this, I always thought the eyes were like, oh yeah, that really, down here, that changes the face. You take that off, people look completely different. The girl who was in the show with me, Kristen Shaw, we were looking through the book one day and we were just like, I, I, I just would never have guessed they look, cause you have an idea from just seeing the mask and the eyes like, oh, kind of put the face together. That's actually really interesting to think about that part of the face. I mean, this is a crazy area to say, way into, but it also kind of makes you think about the masked robbers back in the day and how yeah. much you could or parts of the world in which, you know, people do cover up large swaths of their face. Totally. We had a game, we were like, okay, right when we saw their mask, we're like, okay, so I'm thinking they might look like this, and then they flipped the picture and it was just like, that's a totally different person. <laughs> I think you said this a little bit earlier, which is so many people dream of it, <laughs> so very few people yeah. actually get to do it. I think about that a lot. I'm a pretty big feeler. <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful for it, but when you live in New York and LA in this business, you're very much living in, in the extraordinary, where it's like, everything is like, get your dream, get this. Everything is heightened. The stakes are really high. You can either lose this job or you can get this job and it can change your life. Everybody lives in these extremes. When I booked Arrested Development, that was like my dream. It was my big thing. And when I got it, I found myself not as satisfied as I thought I would be. It scared me because I was like, oh my God, I had my dream and it didn't satisfy me the way I thought. I found myself, I was always looking, even though I was on a great job, I was still looking to my next job. And I realized most of my life I'd not been very present. And if you're not practicing contentment where you are, you're not gonna be content when you get what you want. And I would say, the older I get, it's more about, I would hope this for myself, it was more about finding the ordinary as extraordinary as I have found the extraordinary all these years. That the ordinary is given that much power. I find as much excitement and as much joy from the simplicity of life as I do these heightened extremes that I've lived in for decades. Hey, I want to do this thing I love to do called rapid fire. You mind if I hit you with a little bit of rapid fire? Let's do it. 
Let's do it, yeah. Your favorite book of all time? And there's a book called Hind's Feet on High Places that is an allegory about a little deer named Much Afraid. And it's just a beautiful allegory of life. And I love it. So what would surprise people who may think they know you or may know you from afar? What would surprise them to find out about you? I just recently got into rope bowl making. <laughs> I love to, I should have brought one. I, oh, I've got a picture of one. Can I show you a picture? Please, please, please. I, I started doing this during the uh, during the pandemic. This is one of them. Let me see if I can. So it's like I make these rope bowls. You see that? And, wh and why do they and call them? Why do they call them rope bowls? They're they're made. I, they're made just out of rope. And nobody. It's get the trend of rope bowls. If it is a trend, is going to be gone. But I'm going to be like, no. <laughs> I got 500 made, and you're going to take it. Who's your favorite actor? Tim Conway. He was on the Carol Burnett show. The uh, this elephant uh, had this little dwarf trainer, and uh... <laughs> what role would you love? Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors. Feed me Seymour. Feed me all night long. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? My wife lost her brother when he was in his 30s, and she was. this was a year and a half before I met her. And my daughter is named after him. I've never met him, and I would love to meet with him and just get to know him. What was his name, if you don't mind me asking, what's your daughter's name? His name, name? was Loy, uh, L-O-Y. And she's Loy as well. And she's Loy as well. She was. She's the first girl of a line of guys named Lloyd. And she was the first girl and she got the name. I love that. Hey, be safe. Have a uh, have a really good summer. And thank you again for doing this. I appreciate you coming on. It was so fun, man. Be safe. Hopefully we'll meet in person soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I think of Tony as like your guy. A hundred percent. In 10 years, I'm gonna be sitting, drinking red wine with him, making rope <laughs> He was cool. Yeah, he, he had like this, this uh, very comfortable like type of like conversation. I would have imagined that playing different roles kind of, you tie it into uh, life experiences that you've already had. But I didn't really think about it being like a therapeutic experience for him. I love Tony Hale since uh, Arrested Development and V. His animated series, um, such a big fan of Tony Hale's. Uh, he did not disappoint. He was what I was hoping for and more. Hey, that was Tony Hale. I hope you enjoyed him as much as I did. Easy guy to talk to, seemed really at peace, which I always love to see. Uh, just a very funny, just a very good guy. Very interesting to hear him talk about acting as kind of a form of catharsis. Hadn't really heard that before, loved hearing that as well. All right, listen, before we go, gotta give a quick shout out to our friends at Kiriuma. Now, you know they've not only provided me with the coolest kicks on the planet, but now they're offering them to you too. That's right, log on to kiriuma.com slash Carlos. Get yourself a pair today. They're all kinds of special. Hope you enjoy them. All right, like that, we're out of time, but be sure to like, listen, and subscribe, and join us next time right here on The Carlos Watson Show. <laughs>